America, we stand for freedom. Though freedom is never really free, we yearn and strive for government, protecting our liberty. Hello and welcome to another episode of Your Right to Know. My name is Andrew Kucher and I'll be your host today. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Joseph McKenna, State Representative mm -hmm. uh, of the 18th Worcester District and also Mass Young Republican National Committeeman. How are you doing today, Joe? Doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Happy well, to be thank, here. Thank you for coming. Um, first of all, I kind of want you to just make uh, some information, give the public some information about what are the Young Republicans? The Young Republicans, it's, it's kind of a mirror parallel organization to the state party, the state Republican Party. We've got a chairman, national committee man, national committee woman, and it's an opportunity for people to get involved in campaigns, to uh, talk with people who have Republican values and go out and socialize, but also to get involved. We do outreach, door knocking campaigns, phone calls, support candidates, and it's also a great place to uh, go if you are potentially a candidate yourself, if you're thinking about running for office. Uh, it's a great way to get to know people in the political circles, get your experience uh, under you, and really a, a great place to get involved. Now, what are the ages of what? what Term, determines to be a young Republican. Young Republican is 18 to 40, and there's also a there's a college Republican and a teen Republican organization as well. They follow similar structures, so we certainly hope that our college Republican friends, when they graduate school, transition and, and become young Republicans. So I got six more months to join. So, I mean, <laughs> Absolutely, that's, that's that's a little scary to think about, but okay. Now, when we think and even witness young people in uh, political action today. By and large, they're liberal Democrats. In fact, young people scorn the GOP. Why? I don't necessarily believe that. I think that the, the people you hear are the young liberals. I think there are plenty of young conservatives, young Republicans, but I think it's very similar to the Republican tenets of everyone live their lives, have individual liberties and rights. The American dream, go out and succeed and work. I think young conservatives are too busy to get involved in these protests and all this you know manufactured outrage against an election that they don't like mm -hmm. whereas the young liberals they want to have their voices heard so that's who you hear and they don't and they don't have jobs no, un and unlike you know, you the, know young the young republicans who are just out there trying to put them through self through through college yeah you know many times when i was in college you know i i worked swing shift you mm -hmm. know when, in order to put myself through school and um, I think a lot of young Republicans are too busy. Yeah. Um, now, is the GOP's message of conservative values, fiscal conservatism, uh, in some cases social conservative, um, or is it more of a misunderstanding of what the Republican Party stands for or how we market the party? I think it's very much how it's marketed in the words that we use. Um, I read a great book by Frank Luntz, The Words That Work, and the power of messaging and the power of words that are used is phenomenally important. And I don't necessarily think that the Republican Party does a good, well, a good job of advertising itself and marketing itself to the younger generation. I do believe that especially younger people when they start entering the workforce are fiscal conservatives. Many of my friends, I went to business school, which is, tends to be fairly conservative mm -hmm. anyway, but I had some friends who I knew were more liberal in school, and then they got out, got a job, and started paying their paycheck. And mm -hmm. I remember a few conversations I had where they just started banging their head against the table and saying, yep. what are these taxes, and what is it going to? And so I think fiscal conservatism will always be there. Um, the social landscape is a little bit more difficult, and I think you see a large number of people who self-describe themselves as fiscal conservatives and social liberals or social moderates. Um, as far as the, the big social issues, the marriage issue and the, we had the whole bathroom mm -hmm. debate here in Massachusetts, that tends to be overwhelmingly liberal, especially in Massachusetts. But I think on, on abortion and pro-life, there's a large percentage of people that are, are becoming more and more pro-life as technology proves that life really does exist 
you know, before the birth actually occurs. Mm -hmm. Now, but some of the more liberal people, they're trying to stifle this, uh, people talking about it, uh, Republicans, conservatives. Um, there was uh, that young reporter, um, Milo... Yakinovinovich, or something, however yeah, you something say like his that. name. Yeah. And also Ann Coulter just recently. Sure. In fact, as we speak, I believe Berkeley is, is pretty much facing a riot right now of, of liberals because they don't want conservative speech anywhere near them. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, it's, I kind of feel that there's this sense of not, well, there is obviously a sense of entitlement, but there's also a sense that people are entitled to their comfort, to their, you know, safety net, so to speak. And people, the younger generation especially, I kind of get the sense that they feel they have a constitutional right not to be offended or not to have their thoughts challenged. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was going to school, I was taught, you know, go to school to expand your horizons, to challenge yourself, to expose yourself to cultures and thought processes that you may not have considered before, and that strengthens your perspectives and maybe changes your mind on a couple things, but you come out stronger and more well-rounded. Our current generation is more apt to double down on what they believe and demand some sort of repercussions if yeah. you say something that they don't agree with. Well, I mean, in law you know? school, you know, we were taught First Amendment protects speech that you like and yep. even the speech that you don't like. Yeah, and I think it, the irony is the, the liberals, the, the Democrat Party and, and liberal-minded people especially like to fashion themselves as the welcoming and loving and everyone is welcome in their party but only if you have their same thought. Right, you and know, if you it's, don't, It's a very narrow-minded perspective. And then they take a baton to your head if they don't, they're if they don't very like harsh, what you say. Yeah, very harsh and very critical to any sort of opposing thought. Now, why and when did you become a Republican? I kind of just naturally became a Republican. I've always been strong in faith. I grew up Catholic, went to church my whole life, was received my first communion, baptism, confirmation. So through the Catholic Church, I learned conservative values, both socially and just independently, living a good, strong, accountable life. And then, as I mentioned, I went to business school, so had a, a fiscal background. So I kind of naturally fell in with a cons social conservative, fiscal conservative, and, and the Republican Party was where that all came together. Now, did you come from a conservative family, a Republican family? Um, now that I look back on it, yes. Um, politics was never part of the conversation, per se. Um, I grew up in a single mother household and she never directed a political conversation and wasn't overt in it, but now that I look back, she shares the same values both on the fiscal and social uh, perspective. And so it was more, again, just by naturally growing up in that environment, um, yeah, it was certainly a conservative household. Mm -hmm. Now, were, were you active in Republican politics when you were in college? I was not. No, I, I must admit and make the confession, I was not. I, um, when I came out of college, I was selling life insurance and got involved in a campaign and fell in love with it after the fact. So. Mm -hmm. I was not particularly um, involved. Ironically, however, I was studying abroad in Dublin, Ireland during the inauguration in 2009 after Obama's first election. Mm -hmm. And I did have several conversations that I guess could have foretold a future in politics. We had an inaugural party on the campus and 95% of the people there were celebrating Obama's election. And I was interviewed by the, the local news and I said, well, you know, America certainly wanted hope and change. I'm just concerned that this may not be the hope and change. So I'm, <laughs> I'm keeping a, a withholding my judgment for future. And uh, it was an interesting And what was the reaction in, in Ireland to that? It was not welcome because the, in, in Ireland, as more of a they are, they are socially, socialist, uh, yeah. a socially liberal environment, yep. they all were celebrating, you know, shouting from the rooftops in celebration with Obama's election. So... I, I also rem very clearly recall a dinner I had with some classmates who were, you know, talking about Obama and how great his socialism was, and I was like, I don't necessarily <laughs> think that's a good thing. And so now, it do, wasn't do you still have friends in Ireland? Sure, and, absolutely. And what were their reaction to to Trump's uh, election? Concern. <laughs> Concern. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Now, you stated that you uh, you graduated from Bentley University. Yep. Um, how were you as a Republican perceived on campus by your peers? Again, I, as I wasn't 
very openly political in college. I, I can't really look back and say, you know, I, I didn't join a Republican club. I wasn't part of any school club. So it's hard for me to look back and say it was for or against. I will say I went back and started rereading a philosophy book that was a textbook in one of my classes. And I was just absolutely, my mind was blown at how slanted this textbook was mm -hmm. uh, against, you know, free thought. It, it was very clearly a book that had an agenda that was very liberal. So I think had I been more political in, in college, I might have gotten more involved and certainly may have narrowed my <laughs> now, friend um, groups, per se. You do know? you find that um, the breeding ground back when you were in college, uh, the college campuses were breeding grounds more so now than when you were in college? I, I would say it's definitely more political now. And I think part of that is Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all these instant gratification social networks were in their infant stages when I was in school. We had Facebook, but we didn't have Instagram and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, those See, when, I, when I was in Twitter, college, we didn't even have email. That, <laughs> and that's where a lot of these protests and this outrage, it starts on these social sounding boards. And really, they become echo chambers because you, you tend to be friends with people who are like-minded. And so when you yell about something on Facebook, the echo that comes back is people that agree with you. And mm -hmm. that, that yell just gets louder and louder and louder. And when you're on a college campus and everyone's isolated, that process happens that much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, social media is a tremendous asset, but it is also very much contributing to the fact that we've got so much outrage and anger and angst on college campuses that is so politically driven right now. Yeah. So. What messages resonate with young people when we try to draw them into the Republican Party, or at least becoming a more uh, aware of their more conservative values? I think giving people, it, it sounds cliche, but giving people ownership of the American dream and saying, you know, be what you want, do what you want, make money or be a philanthropist, whichever's your choice. Mm -hmm. I think Republicans support that more than the, Lib the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. and I think those are the types of things that people grasp onto and they, they want to be given the ability to express themselves and, and be supported and I think that's more conservative, more Republican. Now do you find that the, uh, the people in college who consider themselves like say libertarian are more apt to join the conservative movement? I think that's pretty accurate, yeah. Huh. And uh, do you see a larger portion of younger people in colleges saying that they're libertarian well, rather than and socialists goes, or And that goes communists. back to the fiscal conservative social moderate tends to kind of fall into that libertarian because the social moderate piece is, you know, people can do what they choose is best for them and their, their loved ones, whoever that may be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of that libertarian perspective is, you know, give people their, their own identity and their own freedom. And I, quite frankly, I think that there's going to be a challenge on um, who attracts that libertarian support, whether it's a, a Democrat or a, a Republican. And I tend to think that they're closer to the Republican Party, but by being libertarian, there's just a more activism involved with that. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of more of an affirmation that mm -hmm. I'm a libertarian more than Democrat and, and Republican tend to be more standard, mm -hmm. so to speak. Now, what is the sense of young people of the support of Donald Trump. I mean, it seems like obviously the people who are most vocal uh, aren't the majority. There's a lot of people who are just saying, you know what, let's see what he has to do. Do you think that's the case or do you think most young people don't like the idea of Donald Trump? I would say more of my friends are not thrilled about Donald Trump than are. Um, there's just uncertainty about what he means on a global scale. But I think that there's certainly some strengths and positives to having a global leader. Mm -hmm. Because I think for eight years, we didn't have a global leader. We had a global, let's not get involved, and mm -hmm. someone who drew or an red. apologist, really. Yeah, I mean, exactly. When he, when he took his apology you know, tour across you, the world. He had the apology tour to introduce himself to the, to the world. Mm -hmm. And then how many red lines were drawn that were crossed with no repercussions? And how many, you know, warnings were issued. Yeah. And really, now, we, really, we have to, you know, get back what we had. We haven't had a strong leader, you know, when it comes to foreign policy since Reagan. No. And I think we've seen already um, that Donald Trump is, is going to be strong and he's not going to, you know, be jerked around by foreign leaders. Mm -hmm. um, 
sure there are some questions about relationship with Russia and what that means. Those need to be answered. But uh, as far as North Korea, Iran, some of these other uh, nations that sponsor and harbor terrorists, uh, he's made it very clear that he's going to take a stronger stance than we've seen in a long time, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you make inroads with, the, with younger people? What's, what's the best way? Say, I mean, we're, we're close to the same age. Uh, rather than somebody older, you know, the typical uh, old white conservative, you know, how do we make inroads? How do we attract more people to the Republican Party? I think it's got to be at an intellectual level in the sense not of being a wonk and, and being super intellectual, but in, in talking to people and treating them like adults and saying, look, that sounds good, but what's the reality? And, and I think that's so much of the Democrat talking points are what sounds good and what feels good, but on the back end, it's not affordable. There's no real way to do it. And some of these things just aren't practical on any number of issues. Mm -hmm. And I think talking to people and saying, that sounds good, but let's, let's dissect it. Let's look at the implications. Let's look at the consequences of whatever it may be. Free college education is a popular one right now. What does that really mean? How is that possible? And mm -hmm. start to treat them like adults, not just say, yes, that sounds good, so we're going to do it. But really have a conversation about the impacts and the role of government. And I think that you'll find that people, generally speaking, will say, yeah, that makes sense. And you can start to, to approach it that way. Now, you're a, not only are you a young Republican, but you're also a state rep. So yes. we're going to switch it up a little bit sure. and start talking about some of the things that are going on in the state. What's it like to be a young Republican state legislature in the liberal blue state of the People's Republic of Massachusetts? It's interesting. <laughs> it's fun. Now, generally speaking, all of my colleagues are good people. There's a couple that may not be, but generally speaking, everyone's good people. So, you know, there's a good relationship, and I don't feel discriminated against for my, you know, minority status. Out of 160 reps, there's 35 of us Republicans. Mm -hmm. Out of 200 total legislators, we've got 41. So we're certainly the, the vast minority. Um, people are generally good. Um, but as far as getting things done, it's certainly frustrating. And it certainly feels at times like we're, we're being driven by this just train of liberal thought that is worse in the Senate than it is the, the House. Mm -hmm. um, the new Senate president, Stan Rosenberg, one of the nicest guys you've ever met. But he is very liberal-minded, and he is appointed chairman in positions that are very liberal-minded. And they're trying to take the Senate in a very liberal direction. Mm -hmm. And that is starting to have serious implications in the House. Because at the end of the day, the House and the Senate must agree on bills in order for them to pass. So there is a little bit of tension between the House and the Senate. And it's, it's mostly on a, a liberal-minded in the Senate versus the House, which is oddly to say, a little bit more moderate. Um, but being a Republican, I, it can be certainly frustrating, but it's also liberating in a sense, because I can say what I want, I can vote the way I want, and I know that I'm not going to be punished for it, because mm -hmm. right. you can't really punish me. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you find it more daunting than you thought it would be? A little bit. Um, and I say this not to be discouraging to anyone who wants to run for office or who is in office, and not to be discouraging about the state of the, the government, but there also needs to be realistic expectation of what you can go to Beacon Hill and accomplish. Um, I know that I'm not going to go rewrite the tax code of Massachusetts as a freshman or a second-term Republican. I know I'm not going to go get any major landmark legislation passed that's going to you know, make the evening news, anything like that. So I go try to make good votes to do my diligence and, and ensure that we are voting for accountability, for good government spending, for good policy, and then focus my time and energy on my local district where I can significantly make an impact and, and help people. Um, that just is my personal take of, of the state of our Massachusetts legislature. I've seen so many state reps come in as a freshman, you know, having never seen Beacon Hill and how it operates and say, I'm going to change Beacon Hill. I'm going to be the voice to change it. And they get there and it's just like, they just get railroaded. Mm -hmm. and, and you can just see the energy just drain. And it, it can be frustrating, but it, just having those realistic uh, expectations are very important. Now, there are uh, several actions going on on Beacon Hill that I know our viewers are going to be very interested yep. in. Uh, first thing, sanctuary cities, uh, mm -hmm. especially Massachusetts being a sanctuary state. 
can you explain for our viewers the ramification for Massachusetts if such legislation were passed? Well, why do we need to enforce the law? I mean, there's nothing. <laughs> we're not a country built on laws. We don't need to enforce <laughs> the law, right? So. I, the way I figure, if we become a sanctuary city, speed limits don't matter for me anymore. I'm just going to, well, I'm a sanctuary individual. I, I'm going to be a sanctuary on the highway. It's just, it's frustrating to me that as a state and certain mayors and elected officials feel that they're smarter than the federal government and they're above the federal law and, well, we don't agree with that policy, so we're not going to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. We don't get to pick and choose unless you want to become elected and vote on it. You don't get to pick and choose which laws you enforce. And so I think that's an absolutely just distorted message that is being sent. And I'm vehemently opposed to sanctuary cities and, and sanctuary state or any sanctuary of that type. Now, currently, there are six cities that uh, are sanctuary cities, uh, Amherst, mm -hmm. uh, Boston, Cambridge, Lawrence, Northampton, and place that I work at, uh, Somerville. Now, there are also um, cities and towns that are actually contemplating that status. Mm -hmm. Acton, uh, Arlington, Belmont, Hull, Rockport, and I believe Stoughton. Mm -hmm. um, now, in fact, uh, Brockton's uh, Michelle Du Bois posted on Facebook a warning to illegal immigrants about a possible ICE raid. Did she mm -hmm. break the law? I think in action she broke the law. I don't think it I don't necessarily think it was a willful breaking of the law. I don't think she, well, the problem is I don't think she thought much about it at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just blasted out a, a Facebook, and that's part of the problem of this instant gratification social network. She just blasted out a tweet that mm -hmm. didn't think much about and, and felt like, oh, I'm doing a good liberal thing. And in effect, yeah, she broke the law. She, technically speaking, impeded justice by mm -hmm. Giving a tip, whether it was real or perceived, mm -hmm. that ICE was enforcing the law, and that's that's illegal. Um, as far as these other sanctuary cities and President Trump and, and Attorney General Sessions' threats to withhold funding, that becomes a very very high stake game of chicken as to whether they actually will withhold funding, whether the sanctuary cities will renege and, and say, okay, we will enforce the law, because at the end of the day, if the, if they do withhold funding, there are significant impacts that are going to be felt yeah, and mean, there are lives look, that are going to be touched. Yeah, you look at some of these, these cities, Lawrence, um, Somerville, yeah. uh, Boston maybe not so much because they have you know, basically the, the business and the industry yeah. to keep running, but Lawrence, Somerville, I mean if they lose their federal funding, they're, they're out of luck. There's a lot of good programming that's going to be hurt, there's a lot of good local infrastructure that may be impacted and I don't think anyone wants to see that. Um, so I, I certainly hope it doesn't come to that. I hope that the mayors and respective city governments um, come to their senses and say we can't afford to, to put our cities at risk mm -hmm. in that way. Um, but that's going to be a very high stakes game of, of chicken to follow. Now another thing, now that I, I, I have you trapped here, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about is more Healy's gun grab. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently um, the legislature voted to see about reining her in. Mm -hmm. Can you go into more detail Sure. That? So for, for the viewers, I, I'm not sure when this will air, we're currently just after the budget debate in April. And one of the consolidated budget funding items was for constitutional officers uh, in their respective budgets. And a Republican-led amendment would have withheld about $800,000 of increase to the Attorney General's um, operating budget pending a, the decency of a response to the countless letters that were sent to her office last summer when she issued her dictum that she was going to be enforcing this um, artificial you know, gun assault weapon ban. Mm -hmm. There were three letters that I co-signed co written to her office. One was very strong and saying this was wrong and you need to rescind it. One was simply looking for answers, saying there's some confusion out there. We need some clarity. What does this mean? Who's going to enforce it? Is there money behind it? Is there an enforcement agency? Neither of those have been answered. Mm. So, and I know she's been she's been in court, and um, there's some been some freedom of information um, well, acts uh, requests uh, that she's failed to respond sure. to. Or if she did respond, it was hasn't made it known. Well, she did make it known. There was a response uh, last. Uh, um, episode we had um, Jim Wallace of, mm -hmm. of Goal Good friend of mine. Yeah. And he basically explained everything that she she responded with was basically just 
printouts from the internet, like yeah. from websites, from um, gun manuals. Well, even her, even her initial order, if I recall this correctly, had to be edited because the language was mm -hmm. improperly written. It was very clear that it was written by someone who is not familiar with firearms, uh, whether they're rifles or pistols, and mm -hmm. it was just very poorly done. And it, it, as far as the response to the letters, she's found time to campaign nationally on the fact that she is a leader on gun control, mm -hmm. yet doesn't have time to write to her own legislators. Do you, do you, you see know, this in front of the Supreme Court? I do, because as, as we know, there's been challenges brought up in court. Whichever way the court rules, I think the other side is going to challenge, and I think that process is going to go forward with an appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. I just, I don't see any way that one side will say, yes, we're going to accept the ruling of this particular court. I see appeals all the way through. Now, there's another, um, another thing we wanted to bring up, and we in the FRCC, we call it the greedy grab. Mm -hmm. And that was when the state legislature voted themselves basically uh, an $18 million uh, increase in pay. Um, now, can, Obviously, you voted against it. Yep. Can you go into, into more detail? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I certainly voted against it. I felt that this, there were some parts of it that were okay. There were some parts of it that weren't bad. Um, one of them was the judicial pay. Our judges are paid comparably low to other states, um, and they deserved certainly consideration of an increase. But at the end of the day, it was consolidating more power specifically in the hands of the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. The pay raise dramatically improved their pay to the tune of about forty thousand mm. dollars per office and it also gave them increased stipended positions and increased the value basically doubled the value of every stipended position now again as a republican there's not many stipends out there so this is all going to the democrat loyalists within the the party and the speaker now is able to wield even more pay over his members and say vote with me on this or you're not going to be in line for that vice chairmanship that comes with a thirty thousand dollar pay raise mm -hmm. that's a pretty hefty price tag to hold over someone's head to, to get a vote you know it's hard to vote on a principal when you've got thirty thousand dollars and your family on the line you know so in my mind it was just a, a very strong power grab to consolidate more and more power in the hands of the speaker and the senate president that i just didn't think was appropriate mm -hmm. And I mean, what they just recently denied a, um, a tax holiday, saying that we yep. can't afford it, but yet we can afford a tune of eighteen million dollars for for increase in their pay. Yeah, yeah, not only the tax holiday, but we've got an extremely lean budget. Our budget has less. This past budget has less spending than we've had discretionary spending than we've had in previous budgets. Not only that, but we've had multiple years in a row of nine C cuts. Nine C's are the unilateral cuts that the governor can make mid-year when revenue projections come in either higher or lower. Um, he does not need legislative approval to say, we're under revenue projections for the year. We need to cut these accounts. We had those cuts. So basically, we have a budget that is coming in under revenue, yet we have enough to vote ourselves a raise. That just seemed a yeah. little bit yeah. um, disingenuous. <laughs> well. Unfortunately, Joe, I would love to continue. I have a bunch more questions, and we could probably make this into an hour or two hour show. Yeah, absolutely. But unfortunately, that's our time for today. Um, we, we thank you for watching Your Right to Know uh, and sitting in with the FRCC. We leave you, uh, uh, as we leave you, we want you to remember that your local city Republican committee is the only grassroots operation that supports and holds dear your liberty, your constitutional rights, and your conservative values. We encourage you to join us. Why? Because for us, GOP stands for growth, opportunity, prosperity, and because we always stand for freedom. Thank you, and have a good evening. America, we stand for freedom. So let us all unite to yearn and strive for Reflects our values, that preserves our rights, and goes forth in power and might. That reflects our values, and preserves our rights, and goes forth in power and might.